Um, I want to start with um, a quote from a guy named J.I. Packer. And the reason I want to start with this is, if you're not aware, anybody who's come to me and said, hey, I'd like to be discipled, um, we walk people through, I walk guys through, and my wife and I walk ladies through a year-long discipleship process. And um, I'm not going to get into the details of it. It's broken up into three different modules. But the first module, we spend time on spiritual disciplines and your affections towards the Lord, okay? So we walk through what does it look like to fast? What does it look like to read? What does it look like to pray? And then on top of that, so those things don't become legalistic, we want to ask really important questions about how you experience or know or see the Lord, right? Like, do you like the things that he likes? Do you know the things that he likes? And we go through all that. Well, the first book we use on spiritual disciplines is by Justin Early uh, called uh, The Common Rule. The second book that we use in that time is by J.I. Packer. It's called Knowing God. J.I. Packer is a brilliant mind. He sat on the ESV Translating Committee. Uh, He's passed away now. But um, of all people, he is somebody who would take an idea of this, why it's called Knowing God, that there are times when we can read the Bible and we can know things about God. You see this a lot in seminary students. They know a lot of things about God, but they don't have that knowledge about God and, and know how to correlate it to knowledge of God, okay? And so he says, what we need to do is we need to avoid just having knowledge to puff up, but it needs to become knowledge of God. And he actually, at the end of the first chapter, and knowing God, gives a formula. So this is J.A. Packer's formula and how we don't become puffed up with knowledge, but to take knowledge of God or uh, knowledge about God and make it knowledge of him. Here's what he says. He says, how do we do this? How do we do what? Well, here's how do we do this. How do, how do we do this? How can we turn our knowledge about God into knowledge of God? So that's what we're really trying to get at in that first module. And I'll explain why I'm bringing it up here in a second. The rule for doing this is simple but demanding. And he's right. I tell every disciple who goes through the, the process, it is very simple what he's about to lay out, but it requires a lot of effort. It is that we, here it is, turn each truth we learn about God. Step one, you got to learn things about him. A lot of evangelicals can't explain certain uh, uh, doctrines, learn things about him, take the knowledge that we learn about God into a matter for meditation before God, there's step two, leading to prayer and praise to God. So his threefold system was essentially say, learn about God. We should learn about God. And in learning about God, take that knowledge about God and go to God with that knowledge. Don't just start like rattling it off to someone else. Take that knowledge you've just learned and now go to him and say, Lord, I'm I'm learning this. This is what's going on. Help me process it. And then from there, work through that process to go, Lord, this is true. And because it's true, you're amazing. And praise God for that knowledge. Let me give you an example of this. In In this process, there's one of the times where we'll get together and we will ask, all right, I need you to defend the Trinity. Okay, this, you know, Coulter, here it is, defend the Trinity. And so eventually as they kind of work through it, eventually we then walk through how we can understand the Trinity. God is three persons. Each person is fully God. There's one God. We have knowledge of God. Great. Now let's take this knowledge of God. Let's put it before God. And that's what we do. We put it before God and we go, Lord, like I don't fully understand. I don't claim to fully understand the Trinity. Help me understand what this means and how I process all this. And then suddenly, you know, we bring up 1 Corinthians 11. 1 Corinthians 11 helps us see that the Trinity shows us how our marriages within Christianity should operate. That God being three persons, each person being fully God, there's one God. We understand that they, though they are equal in being, they're subordinate in role, which means husbands and wives, and this is what 1 Corinthians says, what Paul says to the Corinthian church, husbands and wives, they are equal, but they're not the same. And so now suddenly I go, Lord, this is crazy. You show Candace and I how we can operate in our marriage. We are absolutely equal, but we're not the same just like you existing in Trinity. So we've taken knowledge about God. We've brought it before the Lord, searched his word to understand it more. And then we praise God for who he is in it. Okay. I say all that because what we're going to break down today is pretty common knowledge, to be honest with you. I mean, we're going to get into some details. Maybe not everyone is aware of, but even if you're not a believer in here, you're familiar with the cross. You know that we believe that Jesus was crucified. And as a believer, you probably know even a little bit more details. Some of you know the insane amount of details. You've seen every possible YouTube video out there on what happens when someone is crucified. You've gone through Awanas and VBS. You've seen and heard it all when it comes to this passage. What I want to do is I want to take that knowledge about God and I want to put it before God, okay? And so then we're going to see what happens and how we process all of that. Now, that being said... um, this passage is going to, like all of the Gospels, is going to give us a lot of details. And I thought about last week and, and having this knowledge about God and, and reading through this uh, account to honestly give even a warning to parents to be like, hey, this is a bit much if your kid's small, because it is graphic. And, and, and I'll be like candid with you. I think it takes a garage door and a padlock 
uh, for us in the West really to uh, believe in human uh, goodness being innately within us, honestly. I think anybody who's not grown up in the United States for the most part in human history, Richard and I were talking about this a couple weeks ago, has been pretty barbaric. I mean, human beings have created ways to punish other human beings that are unimaginable to the American mind. I mean, that we just, we, we truly do not comprehend what is happening to other human beings just across the world and in human history that has taken place. Uh, and, and it's bad. I mean, let's, let's, let's rattle them off. I won't give you a ton of examples, but the reality is that I think of one of the examples that I found out was true through um, um, Scorsese's movie Silence about two missionaries who go to Japan that the Japanese invented a way to kill a human being by simply hanging them upside down. And you don't think that's bad, right? Hanging someone upside down, most likely what's going to happen, not most likely, what will happen is you're just going to pass out and then eventually die. But the Japanese figured out something. They figured out that if you just pluck a little part in your neck in the right artery, that uh, slowly the blood will drip and it will not cause the blood to flow to your brain and you won't pass out. And so you will sit there for days, if not weeks, slowly dying as you bleed out. Now, I want you to imagine for a second the demonic forces sitting around a table going, you know what would work? If we hang them upside down and they don't pass out, we do this. That we've created those kind of ways. At the top of the list, if at, at minimum in the top three to five ways that we've created other ways to have someone else suffer is the crucifixion. Listen to what D.A. Carson says. He says, in 2,000 years of pious Christian, uh, Christian tradition have largely domesticated the cross, making it hard for us to realize how it was viewed in Jesus' time. Crucifixion was unspeakably painful and degrading. Whether tied or nailed to the cross, the victim endured countless, and this is the third service and I haven't pronounced it right yet, paroxysms, I'm just going to say it, any medical student can correct me afterwards, as he pulled with his arms and pushed with his legs to keep his chest cavity open for breathing and then collapsed in exhaustion until the demand for oxygen demanded renewed paroxysms. The scourging, the loss of blood, the shock from the pain, all produced agony that could go on for days, ending at last by suffocation, cardiac arrest, or loss of blood. Crucifixion was universally viewed with horror. In Roman law, it was reserved only for the worst criminals and lowest classes. Listen to this last line. No Roman citizen could be crucified without a direct edict from Caesar. So I want you to imagine a punishment to another human being so bad that with our checks and balances, it has to go through Biden, the Supreme Court, and Congress. That only through our three branches of government, we'll just give it one, President Biden is the only one who can say, no, no, that can happen. We're going, this person, this, they need to experience this punishment. Biden is the only one. Who can say this? At? That's how bad the crucifixion is. So that being said, we're going to read this passage and we're going to go into detail. And, and we're going to meditate on the details and we're going to go through it and we're going to ask big questions. But ask yourself as we read through these details, why such detail? Why spend 40 verses going through this? And this is the least of it. I mean, read the Gospel of John, how much detail you get. I can tell you in 251, a woman named Agatha was martyred uh, um, as a Christian for her belief. And we go, yes and amen, sister. We are grateful for the blood of the martyrs. But if I told you Agatha was pulled from her home at 17 years old, raped continually in a prostitution house, and then eventually raked over hot burning coals with hot broken pottery until she died of exhaustion, that paints the whole thing a little bit differently. I told you the same story. I just gave you detail. That's all I did. And so let's ask, why? Why would the, the benevolent God, the creator of the universe, give us such detail of the death of his son. He wants us to care. He wants us to meditate on it. It matters. All of this matters. So we start in verse 24, our text last week. Our text starts in 27, but if you weren't with us last week, verse 24 is where we're going to start, and we covered this. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourself. And all the people answered, his blood be on us and our children. Then he released for them Barabbas and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. Jesus is now scourged and he is on his way to the cross. Verse 27 is where our text starts. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters and they gathered the whole battalion before him. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and twisted together a crown of thorns. They put it on his head and put a reed in his uh, right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. Verse 31. And when they had mocked him, there it is again, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him and led him away 
to crucify him. So a few things, you haven't been with us before, we're still gonna do the Bible study portion of this. Uh, first of all, they're in the governor's headquarters, which is like the palace courtyard. They put this scarlet robe on him after he's been scourged, right? Uh, John and Mark say it's a purple robe. The idea is um, it's, a, it's a color that Roman officials and high Roman officials would wear, right? And so there, there's this mocking tone that upon the, uh, the open wounds of Jesus, they would put it on and then you can notice then they ripped it off him. That's intentional language there by Matthew to open those wounds back up. It says that they uh, twisted a crown of thorns. They took these uh, thorns. There's a book by Brown called uh, The Death of the Messiah. It's a very long book. And uh, in this book, he goes into the details. I mean, he really does go into the details of, of all of the things that would take place within a crucifixion. And as he goes through it, he has six pages of um, certain plants that would have been available to the Romans to use for certain uh, parts of their weapons. And he mentions, and he argues, that it was actually the prongs of palm branches that they would have taken. I have a, a palm tree at my house, and it's not like the one cool California palm tree. It's like one with the death prongs on it, right? And they're like really long. To take those and, and begin to fasten them together somehow is what he would argue uh, what, what uh, was put on on Jesus's head. You might be wrong, but that's just how he, he uh, says it. And then notice it says he, um, they uh, put his own clothes on him and led him away to be crucified. It was Roman practice usually to crucify people uh, naked, uh, which is going to take place with Jesus in a second, but there needs to be prophecy fulfilled, as Matthew's going to point out. So they put his clothes back on him at this point. He'll be stripped naked in a little bit. Verse 32, and as they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. They compelled this man to carry his cross, and when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means a place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they uh, divided his garments among them by casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch, uh, watch over him there. Verse 37, and over his head, they put this charge against him, which read, this is Jesus, King of the Jews. Now, uh, if you're kind of following the narrative, when it says, and they went out, it assumes they went out of the city, not just out of the courtyard area. They're leaving the city at this point. I think, I think that's true because Mark says, uh, uh, as Simon's coming in, he's coming in from the country. So that's where they, they find him. That being said, they find a man of Cyrene, which is an old uh, Greek settlement in Northern Africa, uh, Simon by name. And they compelled this man to carry his cross, being Jesus's cross. Uh, there have been a lot of Christian efforts to make Simon's uh, work here noble or um, maybe sympathetic. I, I don't, we have no reason to believe that in the text at all. As a matter of fact, the word compelled that you see there is only used one other time in the gospel of Mark. And it's if someone forces you to go one mile, you go another mile, right? So it's not like the Romans are like, hey, how do you feel about carrying a cross? They're kind of like wooing him over there. That's not what's happening. They're making him carry this cross, the cross of Jesus. It's forced upon him. And then it says very briefly in verse 35, right? I mean, this is such a short synopsis of what we... And when, and when they had crucified him, that's it, right? And this is like the capstone of, of everything we've understood in Matthew. I mean, two and a half years of going through it, we all wear crosses, right? And so there's a sense of, and they crucified him, you get a few words there. Now, I want you to know, obviously, it goes into greater detail in some of the other gospels, but there are four things when you hear they crucified him that were options uh, that could have taken place. And then I'll explain why each one. Number one, uh, Jesus' hands are nailed to the cross. His feet could have been tied, but I think his feet were uh, uh, nailed for other biblical reasons that we see in the other gospels. Number two, there are three different options to be crucified. Uh, you could be crucified in an X. You can be crucified in an X shape. You can be crucified in a capital T shape, which is what Jehovah's Witnesses believe Jesus was crucified on. They were wrong. Or then you can also be crucified in a lowercase t, which is a traditional cross. I'm going to advocate, if you, you're looking at the text, if you look at verse 37, I think that's the reason he's, he's viewed, or we should view this as a lowercase t, a traditional cross, because they're putting something above his head, okay, and, and what's going on. It could be advocated, but for the most part, we understand in history that uh, the t, the uh, lowercase t was used uh, in that instance. The third thing is to be aware of, there are a few options of how high Jesus would have been on the cross. You're trying to imagine it. Have you ever seen the silhouette with him and the two thieves, right? Um, he could be a couple inches from the ground or a couple feet. I think it's a couple feet based on verse 48 there and what they have to lift up. And in John 19, 20, I think there's reasons to believe that he's a couple feet off the ground. And then lastly, I, I said that he could be crucified uh, naked or he could have been closed according to Sanhedrin law. Jews were allowed to be crucified with a linen cloth. We're going to see here in a second as we read this next statement, he's eventually naked. It says, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. 
Now, if you're not aware, this is a fulfillment directly from Psalm 22, I want to say verse 18, uh, and it's a fulfillment, it's important, because as this closer strip, usually it would go to the executioner, they're divided. This would include outer garments, inner garments, the belt, his sandals, anything that he would have, they're divided now, uh, fulfilling prophecy that's pointing to, to that. And you can get more of that from uh, John 19, which also gives a, a big account, verses 23 and 24. Now, over his head, it says, and over his head, they put, this is Jesus, King of the Jews. This would be in a, a kind of a white block with either red writing or black writing. That's the best of my knowledge that we would see. So if you're trying to imagine what we're seeing, that's what we're seeing in this moment. Now this leads us to some other figures here. Verse 38. The two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those who passed by him derated him, wagging their heads and saying, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. Verse 41. So also the chief priests and the scribes and the elders mocked him saying, he saved himself. He cannot save him. I'm sorry. He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of, the, of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver uh, him now if he, desire, if he desires him. For he said, I am the son of God. Verse 44, finally. And the, other, uh, and the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. Now, I read verses 38 to 44 together because um, D. Carson actually says, and I think he's right, it is actually mocking that weaves this whole passage together. From the beginning of our passage to the end of our passage, there's different characters going on and different terrible things taking place with Jesus, but the constant is the mocking. The mocking goes all the way through this. We saw mocking, the word mocking already take place twice with the soldiers. Now, the reason this is fascinating is in the worst shot of awful irony in human history, we find this mocking taking place. Meaning, if you look at the mocking taking place, in verse 37, they're, they're mocking him, indeed, king of the Jews. He really is king of the Jews. In verse 40, he really is the new place of God. In real time, the temple is being destroyed and will be rebuilt. In verse 42, he actually is the savior of men and they're mocking him for it. In verse 42 also, he is the king of Israel. In verse 43, he is the son of God. So in a shot of awful irony, with a pinch of beauty by Matthew, he is putting in front of us this idea of what they're actually declaring is true. They're actually declaring truths about Jesus in a mocking tone. And that seems to be the, the thread that kind of weaves its way through this entire passage. This leads us to verse 45. Now in the sixth hour, there was darkness over the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man is calling Elijah, verse 48. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come, save, come to save him. Verse 50. And Jesus cried out, Again, with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Just the, the, again, the context. If you see, notice there it says the sixth hour and it happens all the way till the ninth hour. This is from noon to 3 p.m., a, a time during the day where there would not be darkness, right? So it's after this mocking takes place, after his death, there is this, uh, there's this darkness that ends up uh, hitting the land or uh, before the, his death, uh, there's this darkness that hits the land. I wanna just point out, when you read those words, there was darkness over all of the land, I... I and I'm not saying I'm right in this. I think this is God's way of displaying through nature that there's judgment on the land. I think this is true from Amos chapter eight and also Exodus chapter 10. Both are signs that there is judgment upon the land. Now, I'm not saying that carries over to today, but at least in this moment, God is using the forces of nature to display darkness on land because what you have done is terrible and there is judgment coming upon you. This, this is what, what's, what's going on in real time. Um, did I miss a passage? I, I feel like I was supposed to explain something. Oh, I didn't explain, explain Gaul before. Did I already get to that? Okay. I just had it in real time. Uh, Gaul is like this gross drink. There you go. Okay. Um, it, it's, it's, I, and I don't know why that happened in my mind, just real time. Gaul is a drink uh, with myrrh and uh, um, wormwood mixed together with wine. They would use it as like a, um, a number of pain. And so Jesus actually refuses to drink that um, because he's taken the full brunt of the cross. Think of like uh, World War I and World War II when people would like give uh, soldiers whiskey before they amputate a leg or something like that. Same idea. And Jesus is saying, no, I'm going to forego that. Okay, back to our passage. I, don't, I just realized in real time, I'm a, that's, I'm a mess. Um, okay, so there's darkness over the land. And then he says, Eli, Eli, lamat sabachthani, that is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
Jesus was for sure trilingual. He definitely spoke Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, maybe even Latin. It's possible that he also spoke Latin. Uh, This is a really important uh, uh, verse here because, again, I want to draw your attention to not just Psalm 22, but I want to encourage you to read Psalm 22 this week, okay? This is an important passage uh, written in a language, and this is a direct correlation that's going on here. And um, I just, yeah, this week I would encourage you to read Psalm 22 in your meditations at some point as, as to what we read. This leads us to verse 51. After Jesus' death, um, some weird stuff takes place, to be honest with you. Look at this. So Jesus, he, uh, he yields up his spirit, he dies, and behold, the curtain of the temple was torn into two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks uh, were split. The tombs were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were uh, raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. There's three things. Can you see that? Three things that took place. Number one, the curtain of the whole uh, of the, uh, the temple was torn into two from top to bottom. So Jesus dies. If you're not aware, in the temple, which is built in the Old Testament, there's two curtains. One curtain separates the courtyard from the holy place. The second curtain separates the holy place from the most holy place. Now, it's been argued as to which curtain was split. If the first one is split, it's definitely most well-known. It's Everyone's going to see it. I think we have good reason to believe it was the second curtain, and that's probably more important. In Hebrews, multiple times, you can see this in uh, Hebrews chapter 4, 16, 6, 19, Hebrews 9, 11, and Hebrews 10, 19 advocate that it's the most holy, from the holy to the most holy place, the temple curtain is split, and this um, symbolizes the presence of God going forth, right? Not just relegated to, to one place. The second thing is uh, the earth shook and the rocks were split. We know that this area sits on the Great uh, Rift Valley, which um, gets, even today, the Dome of the Rock sits on a a space where there have been certain sacred uh, Islam things uh, ruined because of tremors uh, of the movement of the ground there. And then the third one, which to be honest with you, I I just want to acknowledge, I am the most confused by and don't even know what to do. Uh, I have a Bible, it's called an inner uh, uh, Levin Bible. It has a blank page between each uh, page. And in my notes, I just wrote so many questions. This is a long one, I was reading Matthew. So many questions of what happens uh, with this. The tombs, this is the third one. The tombs also were opened. Many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised, and coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. So initially, there's just a bunch of questions that I had. These people are raised from the dead upon Jesus' death, and when he's raised from the dead, like, I wondered, like, do they get resurrected bodies or, like, real bodies? If they received real bodies, like, or not real bodies, but physical bodies like we have, um, do they die again? It was like, cool, you got another 30 years, but now you're dead again. How many people did they appear? Those were all, like, big questions I'd have. But the biggest question came on the heels of the statement here. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. So notice, this takes place when he dies, okay? Uh, Because we're going to see it going on in the narrative. But they don't come out of the tombs until the resurrection. And so I just put in my Bible, like, what were they doing on Saturday? Like, so they are, like, they're in the tomb. It's like, wait for it. We're alive. All right, let's go, right? Like, I don't know, but they, they, they're coming out at that point. And I just acknowledge, I mean, the word is the word, and I acknowledge it for what it is. I was just like, I don't know what to do with that exactly. Um, anyway, verse 54. When the centurion and those who are with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake uh, and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, truly, this is the Son of God. And they were, uh, there were also many women there looking on from a distance who had followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him. Uh, verse 56, and among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. I want you just to notice, if you can, notice the declaration here, truly, this was the Son of God. That comes from Gentile lips. It's really important. As a matter of fact, the people that are at the end of the narrative here, just keep in mind, are Gentiles and women. That's that's huge. And I'll just, I'll even say this, both would have not counted in Jewish uh, courts, but women in particular, I find this fascinating. I don't know if this is, you know, coffee uh, coffee cup worthy or belongs in a t-shirt, but it is women who are last at the cross and first at the tomb, okay? It's pretty dope. No women want to amen that. That's fine. Equal pay. We'll get into that, okay? Okay. Whatever, you know, whatever gets amens, I guess. Um, but, but I think it is fascinating that, that, that we see that. Verse 57. Uh, when it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who was also a disciple of Jesus. Verse 58. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen shroud and laid it in, its, in his own tomb, which he had cut out in the rock and rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and went away. Now, Joseph of Arimathea... Um, 
only in Matthew is he mentioned as being rich. We can assume he's rich from the Gospel of John. The, him owning his own tomb is like a retirement home, but like on steroids. And the fact of how many uh, spices he would have had, the dude's filthy rich, right? And so he gives this away. And I think it's beautiful because he's a disciple, right? And that's what disciples do. We give what we have away to Jesus, I think is, is really pretty. I will say this, if you're a Bible nerd, I would encourage you to write Isaiah 53 verses 9 through 12 next to this passage. The reason is, I think this is actually fulfillment of a prophecy that he will be numbered. Jesus will be numbered among the transgressors, okay? He'll, he'll, he'll be buried, or uh, um, he'll die among the, the uh, uh, and being numbered among the transgressors, but he'll be uh, buried with the rich, or rest with the rich is some of the language there. That's fascinating. That's so legit. That's exactly, uh, exactly what happens with Jesus. That he, he's numbered among the transgressors, that, that he takes upon our sin, but he's also ultimately in a resting place of the rich. Maybe not, but I think that's uh, pretty fascinating. Um, that being said, let's finish this out in verses 61 on. Mary Magdalene and the other uh, Mary were uh, there sitting opposite of the tomb. So again, this is the women. Just an FYI, maybe a, a moment of, of cultural understanding there. Uh, there was a law put in place that uh, women were not allowed to mourn out loud while the crucifixion was going on. What happened is people would hire women at certain moments to, uh, to you know, mourn out loud and, and to make a big deal, and the Romans were super pissed about it. And so they end up saying it's illegal. You had to actually mourn in silence if you were a woman uh, silently up to that point. So this in verse 61 is probably the first time that they're kind of letting out that bellowing weeping of what we see because this whole... Uh, uh, interchange is going on and it's done finally. Uh, verse 62, uh, the, d- the next day, that is after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, sir, we remember how that that imposter said while he was still alive, after three days I will rise. Therefore order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people he has risen from the dead and the last fraud will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, you have a guard of soldiers. Go, make it as secure as you can. So they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the, uh, the stone and setting a guard. Now, keep in mind right before this, a stone was already set. They're coming. They're going to set a guard and seal it uh, uh, themselves. Um, I'm going to come back next week to verses 62 through 66. I think it's a perfect segue for us to understand what takes place in the narrative of Jesus. That being said, I just want to draw your attention if I can. This is such a dope line. Pilate says, and I don't think he means it in this way, but he tells the Jews, and I, want to, I feel like I want to tell every agnostic or atheist who doesn't believe in the resurrection, he tells them, go make it as secure as you can. And I feel like challenge accepted by Jesus. Like you, like, go ahead. Like, that's what I want to tell Go ahead and make it as secure as you possibly can. I do this with my kids sometimes. I'm like, okay, you're allowed to tie me up however you want, but then if I break loose, we're wrestling, right? And so I let them tie up, and they're allowed to pin me down, but you can't. Uh, Are you serious? I'm a grown man, and they're little kids, okay? (laughs) And so there's this sense that, like, there's this sense that, like, go ahead, as secure as you can make it. Go ahead, send guards. (laughs) Wait till next Sunday. That's, That's when it goes down, all right? That being said, that's our text, okay? That's our text. And that's where we're left. And so here's, here's what I, I want to do. I actually want to do something we've never done at Pella. And I don't want to walk us through practical application. I actually would like to leave the practical application to you this week. Okay? I want to take the principles from J.A. Packer. Now we have knowledge. Maybe this is the first time you're hearing this narrative. We have this knowledge of what took place to, G, uh, to Jesus in this time. We're going to take this knowledge, and this week, I want to encourage you, as Christians will, it's called Holy Week, um, every year in the church calendar, this whole week, we will meditate on what has taken place. And so we're going to take this knowledge of God, and uh, uh, about God, and we're going to make it knowledge of God, and we're going to bring this knowledge to the Lord, and let's just ask questions. Jesus, what was going on there? Why, why did this take place to you? We, we were, uh, as leaders, we went to like this mini seminar on Friday and it was on discipleship. And just ask a very simple question in discipleship about the Bible. What does this chapter that we're currently reading have to do with the rest of the book in that Bible? Uh, uh, the rest of the, the book that you're reading through. It's very simple. So, so you could take this week and go, I'm reading chapter 27. I'm reading the crucifixion accounts. What does this have to do with everything that I'm reading? So I'm bringing it to the Lord. And as I bring it to the Lord and the Lord begins to reveal in his word and in prayer, I'm reading, and I'm going to go to God and I'm going to go, Lord, this is amazing. This is crazy. So, so let me give you some examples. I found a list of 14 things. It'd be like a scavenger hunt this week, right? 14 things. And it could be more, but 14 things that I think scripture actually points us to if we have this knowledge. And I go, Lord, why would you, doing nothing wrong, you became human, which are the account we just read is absolutely offensive to anybody who's not Catholic, uh, Protestant, or Orthodox. This offends Muslims, this offends Jehovah's Witnesses, that God would experience death. 
That's unique to our worldview. And so it's worth meditating. God, why would you have done nothing wrong, experienced death? Why would you do this? So I'm going to bring it to God. There's the truth. I see this, this reality. I read through it. And I see these things, and my attention is drawn to, for example, in John chapter 1, verse 29, John the Baptist calls Jesus the Lamb of God, here it is, who takes away the sin of the world. In Isaiah 53, 6, it says, the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. We can see in Hebrews 9, 26, to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. That's just one idea. We can also see a second idea would be in Colossians chapter 3, that he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame. We can see a third idea as we read through Hebrews chapter 2, that he has um, freed us from subject of lifelong slavery because of fear of death. So now I'm reading, Lord, this is what you did. Why would you do this? I'm bringing it. Why would all this take place with you? Well, now all the demons, all the devils, all the principalities that have subjugation over all of mankind, he goes, death is their only tool. I just took it from him. And so now for freedom's sake, we've been set free. And now we're free in that. We don't have to worry about death. We don't, have to, we, we don't have to worry about not having power over the principalities of the air. Jesus has accomplished that on the cross. And you know what that does? That humbles me. I go to God and I go, Lord, why for me? Like, why? That doesn't make any sense. Like, I did you everything I'm reading, and you're telling me this is why you did it. Like, you're so good. You're so good. You're so good to me. You're so good to your church. You love us enough to like shatter every wall that I've tried to put up. That's the process. Again and again and again. Let's take this week, for example, on Palm Sunday, which is today, the celebrating of palm branches. Holy Monday, Jesus purifies the temple. Holy Tuesday, people try to trap Jesus. Spy Wednesday, Judas sells Jesus out. Maudie Thursday is when Jesus celebrates the Last Supper with his disciples. Good Friday is what we will walk through on Friday. And, and, and Saturday is important with Holy Saturday as well because we'll walk out of here on Friday and there will be no communion. There will be no celebration. The lights will be done. We'll walk out of here and we have lost. We have lost. And that makes Sunday amazing because we haven't lost. Now, there's one other thing very practical I want to put in front of you, and it's something I encourage us as a church to do every single year. I'd like to invite you to join me, as I do every Easter, to fast with me from Friday to Sunday, to have water only. And that could be um, maybe your last meal is on Thursday night for Maudie Thursday. You get together with some people and celebrate uh, in that way. And then uh, you fast all day Friday, all day Saturday, and then you can eat on Sunday. Jesus rose early, so if you want to eat as soon as you wake up, that's fine too. Or if you want to wait till after church, your call. Um, but even if you want to fast only going like right before the service, I just want to invite you to that. And, and this is something Christians have done for a long, long time. But there is something beautiful about uh, us putting ourselves in a place like an Advent to go, Jesus, like how long? That's going to be the last song we sing on Friday. How long? Like how long is this going to be? Like it feels hopeless. We've lost. Uh, we, are, we are a joke if we read 1 Corinthians 15. We're to be mocked and uh, pitied among all other people. And, and so we have this idea. And then Sunday, you don't just get excited because Jesus rose. You get excited because you got endorphins because you're about to eat, right? There's a sense of like, uh, now Sunday becomes beautiful. It's amazing what actually took place. So it uh, feels a little more practical, but the practical, practical application side is going to be on us this week as a church, individually, to go forward and meditate on the scripture, what actually took place. Let's pray.